After taking a look at Intel's i5-12400F and this Asus B660 board in a recent video, which I'll link in the cards above, I thought it would be interesting to take a look at how far Intel has come on their 400 series of i5 chips in just a couple of generations. I bought a 10400F back in 2020 to test and Intel sent me both the 11400F and 12400F so let's see how they all compare. First, let's start with a spec comparison. All three are six core 12 thread chips and surprisingly, the oldest 10400F actually runs at the highest base clock of 2.9 gigahertz with the 11400F dropping that to just 2.6 gigahertz and the, the newest 12400F being clocked even lower at 2.5 gigahertz. The boost clocks, on the other hand, are the opposite, with both the 11th and 12th gen chips running at 4.4 GHz on boost, and the older 10400F a slightly lower 4.3 GHz instead. All three of these chips are listed as having a 65 watt TDP, although its maximum turbo power figures differ pretty widely, as the 10400F peaks at 134 watts on its PL2 limit, the 11400F is even higher, 154 watts, and the newer 12400F is a fair bit lower, 117 watts. It's also important to note that for both the 10th and 11th gen chips, that PL2 limit is only active for 28 seconds before it drops back down off a of boost, whereas on the 12th gen chip, it doesn't need to drop down off of its boost at all at any point unless it's thermally constrained. That might be helped by the fact that this 1200F has finally moved off of Intel's 14 nanometer process node and is now using their smaller Intel 7 node instead. It'd be fair to say that just from reading the spec sheets, these all seem rather similar, but I think you'll be surprised at just how differently they perform. I'm going to include my results for both the 12600K and the Ryzen 5600X so you have a few extra data points of comparison here and I think I'll be starting with the gaming results. Now these were all run uh, with an RTX 3060 at 1080p on what I call realistic settings. The, the preset that I feel in a given game has the best balance of performance and visual quality, which tends to be somewhere between medium and high, although I'll list all of those settings at the top of the charts as usual. Starting with Shadow of the Tomb Raider, all but the oldest 10400F maintain almost identical in-game performance here. The average FPS values are just 3 FPS apart, again save for that 1400F which is about 10 FPS down on the rest. That shows quite clearly that, at least with the 3060, the GPU is the bottleneck for all but the 10th Gen i5. But that isn't actually the, the whole story. Well, the actual in-game FPS, the, what you actually see when you play, doesn't change that much. The CPU render data that the, the built-in benchmark returns is rather insightful. It shows very clearly that between the three generations, the CPU performance has improved leaps and bounds, jumping from 229 FPS average on the 10th gen to 263 FPS on the 11th and 299 on the 12th gen. That is an impressive leap. Microsoft Flight shows pretty much the same thing. It's a GPU bo bottleneck for all bar the 10400F, although this time it's only four FPS shy of the pack, uh, which is actually the same gap that the 1200F has to the 12600K. But regardless, all of the chips managed to offer a perfectly reasonable experience, at least on the medium preset here. CSGO, as always, shows possibly the most stark difference with a 250 FPS spread. Of the three generations of i5 chips, the 12400F still holds the lead, although the 11400F isn't all that far behind, at around 10% slower, although that is a full 20% faster than the oldest 10th gen i5, and even the 1% the low figures suffer too. 
Comparing to the 1200F, that manages an impressive 34% more performance over the 1400F, although to be clear, it still runs at 282 FPS average, and even the 1% lows are 120 FPS, so it's perfectly, perfectly playable. It's just not the 377 that the 1200F can offer, or the 573 that the 5600X 5, offers instead. Cyberpunk manages to rein things back a little with a pretty tight spread across the board. In fact, even the 10400F is functionally identical to the rest of the pack, with the only catch being the 1% low figures, which do suffer a little more than any of the other chips, although it's only a 5 FPS difference, it's only 5 FPS down on the next faster chip, so it's not exactly terrible. Fortnite, much to my surprise, actually shows a bit of a gap between the 12th gen chips and uh, the Ryzen 5600X and the two older i5s. Not a massive one still, but you go from getting over 150 FPS up to 159.5 on the 12600K to 146 FPS on the 1100F and 144 on the 1400F. Again, this is still very close and is literally running at 144 FPS, making it a perfect match for a 144Hz 1080p display, but I'm somewhat surprised to see, well, much if any difference here. And finally, in Watch Dogs Legion, you get a bit more of a stark difference, with the newest 12th Gen i5 averaging 115 FPS, the older 11th Gen i5 getting 106 average, and the oldest 10th Gen i5 can't even break a 100 FPS average, running at 97 instead. Add to that the considerably lower 73 FPS 1% low figure, compared to 89 FPS on the 12400F, and I'd argue that that is a reasonable difference. Of course, it's hardly what I would call unplayable by any stretch of the imagination, but it does indicate that the CPU is at least somewhat of a bottleneck there, and may mean that higher end GPUs that you might want to pair with this, or even just newer, more CPU demanding games, may struggle on that older chip. So, as it stands, if you have RTX 3060 levels of GPU power or lower, you likely don't have that much of an issue running even the two generation old 10400F. It offers a perfectly decent gaming experience and performance, even at 1080p on medium to high settings, although it is starting to fall behind the newer 11th and especially the newest 12th generation chips. How significant of an issue that is will mostly depend on how much GPU power you have on tap though, as like I said, the RTX 3060 that I've been testing with is just about enough to show a, a slight difference in, in most games, but something like a 3070 or 3080 would likely be a, well, a much more hindered uh, experience and hindered by the, the older and slower chips. As for productivity tasks, well, none of these chips are the sorts of ones that I would instinctively recommend for something like video editing or rendering. They certainly can still perform well, and it's something that you might want to, to dabble in on the side, so we should take a look at that performance too. Starting with Cinebench R23 single threaded, you can see the rather nice progression from the 10400F netting around 1100 points, the newer 11400F netting more like 1400 points, and the newest 1200F netting just shy of 1700 points. That is a sizable improvement gen on gen, or over 50% up from going from 10th to 12th gen, which is incredibly impressive. In the, the multi-threaded test, that single-threaded performance translates well, with an even more impressive near 60% improvement going from 10th to 12th gen, or over 20% going from 10th to 11th. Blender shows a similar trend, with the BMW scene rendering over a minute faster on the 1200F than the 10400, and interestingly, the gap from the 1100F to the 1200F is a fair bit wider here, potentially thanks to the different boost behaviours of the two chips. Where the 11400F boosts high and then drops after 28 seconds, the 1200F maintains a constant boost level without much difficulty. 
in the gooseberry scene, the 12th gen renders the frame nearly six and a half minutes faster than the 10400F. Like six and a half minutes for a single frame. That is an immensely large difference. Although even the 11400F takes just shy of three minutes longer, which is still substantial. Finally, in the Adobe CC apps using Puget Bench, Premiere Pro shows a pretty stable improvement as you get newer in the, in the chip lineup. The score spread isn't exactly a, a chasm, but the 1200F does score around 16% higher than the 1400F, or around 7% higher than the 11400F. After Effects is where the 10th gen chip struggles pretty hard as the 1200F scores are around 38% higher and even the 11400F nets around 24% more performance than the 10th gen chip too. The gulf between the two older i5s and the, the newest widens significantly in Photoshop though, with the 1200F scoring 34% higher than the 10 and 17% higher than the 11. It's worth noting that while the power limit figures for the 10th and 11th gen chips are pretty high at 134 watts and 154 watts respectively, I saw more like 75 watts under load from the 10400F and around 126 watts under load from the 11400F, whereas the 1200F is capped more firmly at its 117 watt limits, although I don't think that I have overly accurate data for that one at the moment, so uh, I can't see what it's actually doing all that well, but I'll get back to you as soon as I uh, as soon as I can on that one. So wrapping up then, it's clear that the improvement gen on gen has been pretty substantial, especially in the productivity results. I mean, a 60% improvement in multi-threaded performance over just two generations is pretty excellent. In games though, it seems like your GPU is still a bigger factor. Although the higher end the card, the more your CPU will start to be a problem. If you are gaming on a 10400F and you're using a, a sort of mid-range card, something like a 3060 or lower, I honestly wouldn't be too concerned right now. If you have a higher end card though, and especially if you still game at 1080p, then you might want to keep these, these results in mind the next time you're itching for an upgrade. If you have an 11400F, I'd be even less concerned, and if you don't have any and you're looking to, you know, considering building a new system, this the 1200F does offer the best performance, albeit at the highest price tag, especially when you include needing an LGA 1700 board like this B660 Tough board from ASUS. So you've heard the, the results and a little bit of my thoughts, but I would love to hear your thoughts in the comments down below. Which of these chips would you go with yourself if you had to pick them? And if you do already have any of them, would you consider upgrading or are you going to stick where you are? Feel free to let me know in the comments down below. If you want to pick up at very least the newest two chips, the 11 and 1200Fs and the B660 board, I will definitely be leaving links to those in the description down below for you to check out. Those will be Amazon affiliate links that will take you to the local Amazon store. We can see pricing when and where you watch this and potentially pick one up if you fancy. If you want to support the channel and you can do so in a load of different ways, you can stay up to date on all of the new videos from me by hitting the subscribe button and turning the bell notification icon on, or you can support more directly becoming, uh, by becoming a YouTube member through the YouTube join button and get cool rewards to doing so, or you, you can become a patron instead over on Patreon, link in the description. There's also links to stuff like merch hoodies or t-shirts like this one or a load of other designs that I made myself, or other affiliate links or places like like Overclock GK if you're buying from there. Feel free to take a look at that link in the description. And I'll also leave some more videos on the end cards if you want to take a look at those and keep watching. Maybe take a look at the original video talking about the 1200F and the B660 board if you want to learn more about that. Otherwise, thanks for watching. Hope you enjoyed it. We'll see you on the next video.